trying with haste to try and put out some videos. I want women to see how special they are in the sight of the Lord when they're as He made them. I want them to see how man's way of thinking is so backwards. The Lord, you know, He doesn't look, look at things the way we do. It's written, you know, that His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. We as humans, we look at things through pride. You know, it's always that pride of who am I and wanting to be seen rather than, you know, the way it should be to where He should be seen. And when we look at this and we really get down to it, and that there's probably some out there that probably think, well, that's just some transgender who's speaking. And when we get down to it, it's not a case of a transgender. See, you see, there's a difference between a transgender and an Enoch. So, before I go any farther into why women, you know, glorify our Lord so much in femininity and subjection, I just want to, you know, uh, confront a couple of areas with Enoch and transgenders to clear that matter up. If you ever notice, you know, transgenders, they say that their mind does not match their body. And, you know, it's not in my place to judge them. It's in none of our place to. But, see, that's not an Enoch. Jesus said there were Enochs that were born Enochs. There were Enochs who were made Enochs of men, and there's Enochs who made themselves Enochs for the kingdom of God's sake. This goes hand in hand with Ezekiel 44, verse 25, where it says a priest, you know, for the sake of a sister, brother, mother, father, kin, or, you know, a uh, daughter or sister living at home, they could defile themselves, and in doing so, you know, it wasn't held against them. And that, what that means is that's a, that's a grace that's given whereby a person can be made an Enoch that he can be either male or female. Now when we look at transgender people, there's a big difference that a lot of people may not see. Many transgenders, male to female, transgender, transsexual, they have a trait that an Enoch does not have. A transgender person typically, if you look at various websites, you'll see that so many times, what they do is, you know, they may, oh, live as the opposite sex for a year or so before getting SRS, you know, sexual reassignment surgery. And when they do that, typically, and then they get the surgery to live full time as the opposite sex as a female, they have a trait that you don't see amongst an Enoch. If you notice, they want to be female, but they don't want to be female according to Scripture. Now stop and think about this a minute, okay? They want to be a female, but they don't want to be a female according to Scripture. And they may very well feel that they are. I'm not judging them. You see, there's many reasons that people have that. Some are actual medicinal reasons. They are actually valid with medicine. And that's through the course of various drugs that mothers were given from, I think, if memory serves me right, it was the 1940s and 1970s. And it affected their, the way that their brain was made while in the womb. And it caused an imbalance. Then there are others who actually you know, they have had spirits, you know, from Satan come at them. Those spirits of Satan try to pervert the Word of God. So see, it could be many things. And we don't want to lump everybody together as just being, you know, demon-possessed because they're a transgender. There are 
even some out there who have uh, feelings such as, you know, I, I know of a man who feels like a woman. But what he didn't realize until the Lord reveals it to him was that he was actually to be used as an Enoch. So when you get down to it, he started teaching women and, you know, he blended so beautifully with them. And that's good, you know, that he could do that. And, but see, for the most part, when we get into transgender people, here's the trait that you'll notice. Many want to be a woman or female, but they don't want to live scripturally sound as one. In other words, what they'll do is, you know, whether or not, you know, they get the SRS. When you live as a woman, if you notice, these are the ones that are into the makeup, the sexy clothing, the high heels, you know, corsets, etc. They're into all this stuff. And what is the bottom line on that? It's to be seen. It's kind of like wanting to be the blonde bombshell. And when you look at that, you know, that revolves around two things. That's wanting to be seen and it's to look sexy. Okay, and that's not the way women are supposed to be. So now when we look at these things, now let's take them a step farther. When you have a, a Enoch, now you can have the various kinds. There's Enoch's born, you know, Enoch's from their mother's wombs. There are some who are born missing various body parts to keep this clean. Now, but then there's also those who are born that basically do not feel one way or the other. You know, they just don't care if they're male or female. It just don't matter to them. Then you have those who are made in X of men. Now, when they're made in X of men, that's typically harem X. You know, we read about them. And now, my Islamic sisters over, you know, in the Middle East, they probably have heard the tales. And probably There may even be some of the older ones who know of them. You know, they lived in harems with the women as the women. But yet kept order in harems. And when they're made of enochs of men, that's when a body part, shall we say, is removed. And that would be frustrating for them. Because they're around all these women and they can't do anything. Now that would be frustrating. Now, when you get down to it, <clears throat> those who have made themselves enochs for the kingdom of God's sake. Let's start with the very head enoch. The best one, the biggest, the greatest example of an Enoch that made himself an Enoch for the kingdom of God's sake. This is Jesus Christ. He came into this world as a very bride he would redeem. He didn't marry, he didn't have children. He didn't date, didn't have sex. He came as the bride he would redeem with his blood. And he likened himself to a mother hen, you know, who gathered her chickens under her wing. Now you really stop and think about how much glory he had with God. And yet he came into this world to live as the bride he'd redeemed. Now that takes a lot of humility. See, it even says he was veiled in flesh. You know, Paul wrote about that. We, you know, come to a new and living way through it. The veil of his flesh. That's why a woman's veil is so important. You know, it, as a veil hid the glory of our Lord, their veil hides their glory, their hair. Why even Rebecca, she veiled herself to go in to, to go to meet Isaac. And you know, when we hold services of any sort, and we feel the Spirit of God come into the building, then the women should be veiled. See, they're a type and shadow of that bride of Christ. They should be veiled. They should hide their glory. You know? And it even 
it says, you know, that they should uh, have shamefacedness and sobriety as a type and shadow of the bride. That's why I love, that's one thing I do like about the niqab. See, the niqab, I mean, hides the glory. It hides the glory of the hair. It could actually show the shamefacedness of sobriety. It signifies, you know, uh, not just like the, the veil, you know, the hijab style the Christian ladies wore. It also shows, you know, covering their glory. And it signifies the veil of the flesh of our Lord that hid his glory. He stood right before the Jews. And even though he stood before the Jews, they still could not see the Son of the living God. It hid all that express image of God Almighty right from them. He stood right from them. And you stop and you think about it. You know, the ladies, they always wore gloves and veils. Now think about the, think about the way our Lord's veil did, worked. It hid his glory. He could stand right in front of people. They didn't see the express image of God. Oh, Peter, James, and John saw it on the mountain when he was transfigured. But look what else it did. That veil allowed him to touch a sinful man, and yet it did not defile that Holy Spirit within that veil. Kind of like the veil that sisters wear. It keeps the rain and snow and sun from harming their hair and their gloves they can touch without defiling their fingers. And see, these things are especially important when it comes to coronavirus and such, because if you're wearing gloves, it'll protect your hands. If you're wearing a veil, it'll protect your hair. But, and here's what I like about the niqab, it protects your eyes in multiple layers. You know, if someone coughs, there's less of a chance it's going to go through two or three layers of Georgette as it would if your face was bare. So when we look at these things and we look at an Enoch, you know, you make yourself an Enoch for the kingdom of God's sake. There's a God-given gift of meekness and many people don't, you know, understand these things. It says, you know, brother, if you see your brethren overtaken in a fault, Restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. Remember, Moses was the most meek man there was, but yet he killed an Egyptian. So you stop and you look at that spirit of meekness. Jesus said, take, upon, take my yoke upon you, for I am meek and lowly of heart. Spirit of meekness. That same one who likened himself to a mother hen. See? There's a spirit of meekness. And when the Lord wants somebody to be an Enoch, he can remove any sexual desire. There's no big deal. There's no desire to be the blonde bombshell or buy sexy clothing, but to be a scriptural female, discreet, chaste, keep her at home. You know, praise God. It's a, to be one who's willing to teach the younger, the older, women teaching the younger. And when you're an older Enoch, you can teach the younger women. And you can, to the women, you can be as a woman. Kind of like Paul said to the Jew, I became as a Jew. Ornan, when, when David went to get the threshing floor of Ornan, it says that he spake unto David as a king to a king. See, when we look at these things, you know, Men, they can tell women how they should live, dress, veil, be in the house. And it's deemed sexist, it's mass chauvinistic. But if God can give a spirit of meekness to an Enoch, he can be as a woman. Matter of fact, in my last video, I slipped up because it becomes so natural that I was talking about something in the video and rather than say sisters, I said we. And I caught it as I listened to the video later on. It's like, you know, it, it kind of hit me that you can be, you know, there can be that kind of meekness. It's a spirit of meekness where you're talking to a sister as a sister. 
You're not talking down to her like, hey, I'm a guy. You need to do this to please God. But it's no, it's as a sister, it's, you know, sister, we need to dress this way to please our Lord. We need to act this way to please our Lord. We need to teach younger girls to please our Lord. Just what it says in the scriptures about, you know, train up your child. And the way he goes when he's old, it won't depart. You know, and Deuteronomy says, train up the children. See, this applies to both Islamic ladies as well as Christian ladies. You know? Oh, I'd like to see, you know, people convert to Christianity, but I'm not going to look down my nose at, you know, Islamic sisters. You know, those who are, you know, trying their best to serve God. Do I feel they're right? No. But am I going to try to convert them? No. I just want to see, like the Christian sisters, I want, I want the Islamic sisters to see how precious it is to be a female, to have your spirit put in a female body. And what the world calls, oh, it's oppression and, and such like that. No, there's a grace, there's a freedom there. It's like that Enoch with that spirit of meekness, you know. If he's used as a as a man of war, a soldier, oh yes, he can preach a sermon that will cut all the lies apart. And it would be surprising at how bold he can be. But when he's used as a female, as a sister, you know, he can blend with them. It's just when the Lord wants something done, he can do it. He can supply. You know, so when we look at these things and we start looking at Enoch, those who have made themselves in Enoch for the kingdom of God's sake, as the Lord wants them to, then he supplies this meek spirit. You're not looking down your nose at him. But just as Ornan to a king spake unto the king, as a sister, they speak unto their sisters. Because they want them to realize how special they are when they're not trying to be men. The transgender people, though, if you notice, they kind of go with the worldly position of a woman. Short skirts, hot pants, or whatever. You know, high heels, stilettos, corsets. You know, fancy hairstyles, a lot of makeup, and such, you know. And that's not being a lady. That's not being a, a female according to Scripture. See, to be a female according to scripture is the bride of Christ. And like in my last video where I was talking about the freedom of the veil and the freedom of being, you know, counted worth half of that of a man. You know, when you look at these things and you see it for what it is, that freedom, you know, that, you know, when you're living the way you should, according to scripture, whether you're Islamic or whether you're Christian and you're living the way you should and you, you sin and you know you love God you just you just want to please him and, then, and you sin well unto whom much is given much is required with that authority of being a father and a husband now he has to you know, if he allows that sin, then he has to answer for it. The veil has made you free. It's kind of a type and shadow of the church being covered by the Spirit of God. Our Lord being veiled in flesh. See? So actually, if you look at it in that, in that light, just as the veil of his flesh allowed our Lord to touch what he couldn't touch, that same mercy applies unto women. That the veil allows them to make mistakes which can be forgiven through subjection to father and husband. And then if he okays it or approves it, then he's got to answer for it. They don't. They're in subjection. They're covered. You know, they're veiled. They're covered by the authority of their father or their husband. It becomes a freedom. You know, to where you don't have to worry as much about offending God as normally you would. 
So when we look at it in that light, you know, see that's just backwards as the way people think. You know, we're all just human. We're made subject to vanity, and then our mind. You know, if we're if we are really honest, our mind wants the things that go against the word of God. The spirit that's in us lusts us to envy. You know, we'll chase a lust before we'll go for the Lord. You know, the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can trust it? You know, our heart will, you know, be envious of things that go against the word of God. But when the spirit of God leads us and we truly want to live for the Lord and the spirit of God's leading us, you know, then, by the Spirit of God, we'll seek the things that glorify the Lord. See, and one of the blessings that the Lord can give, you know, a sister, is to realize how precious she is being female, and how precious subjection is, femininity, dressing like a lady, going back to the dresses, the skirts, and the veils, and that be the lady that the good Lord made you, in the case of the Islamic women, you know, to be able to see that you're, you know, you're precious as you're made. You might be valued at half the man, according to the law, but you got to remember that's because when you're valued at half of what a man is, you have less responsibility and you have less to be accountable for because it's transferring you know that accountability to the one who has the authority your father your husband and it really gives you freedom and that and when we look at the transgender people and the enochs and that we can see that an enoch's not a transgender because an enoch his body matches his mind and what it is, is he just has either a, if he's used like a, a man of war like Ebed Medic, who raised Jeremiah up out of the pit, or if he's like that Ethiopian uh, Enoch whom Philip was sent to, and that he's a man of war, he can preach, and then he can preach with a boldness that would shock people. And you know, that's no problem. That's the spirit of boldness that the Lord can give him. But if he preaches, you know, or teaches as a female, as a sister, he can have that meek spirit. And he can be like, you know, the keeper of the house of women. You know, as I just spoke in a prior video about how women are actually created to be kept in the house. The Spirit of God keeps us in the faith. And then some of these issues I'd like to go into way farther someday. And then, but it's the Spirit of God that keeps us in the household of faith, as it's called, the house of women. And, then, and that Enoch, you know, in, who, you know, was over the house of women, and then kept the order in it, his name was Haggai, I think, and, you know, Esther only wondered what would please the king, and she knew that Haggai, that Chamberlain, that Enoch, could supply that. So that's all she required, and he gave her what pleased the king. Now the other girls, you know, the other virgins who were rounded up, and they were gathered. They wanted what pleased them, evidently, because only Esther pleased the king. And if you even go back into Song of Solomon, you'll see that, you know, that one, you know, who's beautiful in the sight of the Lord is one, you know. She ravished the Lord with one eye, you know. So when we look at these things, you know, we start putting more and more of the scriptures together on how glorious, you know, the sisters are in femininity, subjection, modesty, chaste, you know. And we look at these things and we see the Enoch's over the house of women like Haggai. We see that Esther pleased the king because she only wanted what pleased the king. And Haggai gave her that, that Enoch. We can also see that when women are rebellious, 
such as in harems, there was two or three Enochs who cast Jezebel down. And see, this is what I want to warn my sisters about. Don't be like Jezebel. Jezebel married a weak man. Remember Eve, Satan, who was cast out of heaven. He wanted to be his God. He came down into the garden and he told Eve, he said, you know, the Lord knows that, you know, the day you eat of this, you'll be his gods to discern good and evil. She wanted to be his God and she took the forbidden fruit. And her husband Adam, she showed it to him. And he was weak and he ate of it. Rather than, you know, be the husband, the head, rather than be her master and say, no, no, we're not doing that. He went along with it. And how many men do that today? Anything their wife wants, they allow it. And that will be many downfall, you know. And then, so when, when he did that, see, Eve wanted to be his God. She followed that same spirit that Satan's God, you know. And then Adam was weak, he went with it, got him cast out of the Garden of Eden. And then we see that all along through time, Satan used that same pride. You know, when we look at it, you know, here's Ahab, he was a weak husband, and he had Jezebel. Jezebel wanted to be, you know, as God, she wanted to be, you know, the queen, the king. So what she would do is she would do things in Ahab's name, meaning his authority. And she would do things in Ahab's name and his authority, and rather than rebuke her and be the man of the house, and rather than be her lord or master, her husband and head, he would go right along with her anything she wanted. Well, finally, she sent so much that when Yehu came, he said, who's with me? And two or three Enochs looked out the window. And, uh, and they cast Jezebel out the window, and she was killed. Ahab, too, he was destroyed. She, for wanting to be as God, you know, as a king, she wanted to rule. And she, you know, did all manner of wickedness in the name of the king. And now when you really get down to it, look at the name of that king Ahab. He allowed that, he was weak, and he was destroyed. Now our Lord is not a weak husband to his church. And he is not weak with his bride. He's not going to do things the way we want. He's not going to be destroyed like Ahab. And he's not going to allow us to be like Jezebel. So he'll send an Enoch into the assembly of the women, into the house of women, the cloister, the harem, whatever. And when he sends them into there, that Enoch will be just like them sisters. And he'll be given the ability to teach them why femininity, subjection, to be chaste and modest. And all these things are so important for pleasing the Lord. And many, you know, many of these things can carry over even into the Islamic faith. Because, you know, many of them stem from the first five books of the Bible. And we know that Muhammad, he, that's what he used to write the Quran. Muhammad actually, you know, spoke a lot from the first five books. It's what's called the Torah. And he spoke about that. So see, that's where some of the Islamic you know, views with women, you know, veiling and being kept in the house. They're scripturally sound with veiling and keep being kept in the house. It's the Spirit of God that keeps us in the house. Same thing, but it's just a spiritual type and shadow, you know. Just as the Enoch, you know, can be a physical Enoch who is sent to share a word, share a teaching, prepare, you know, women to return to the old ways or that Enoch is also the spirit of God which will bring the rightly divided word of God to the sisters by way of a preacher you know and that when we see that then we see one other woman you know sisters we don't want to be like Athaliah Athaliah she got so evil she killed 
you know, the king's sons. And they hid one. And when they hid him, she was, you know, queen for a while. And she ruled. But when that son got old enough to be anointed king of Israel, they brought him out. And they anointed him king. And she saw it. She cried treason, treason. Now look at that, sisters. We don't want to ever cry treason, treason. Think about this. You know, when we see that women are to be married, bear children, guide the household, be discreet, chase keepers at home. Older women should teach younger. Why do we want to go against that? That's the same as crying treason, treason. I don't want the Lord to rule over me. I don't want the king to rule over me. I want to rule. That's taking on the authority of the husband, you know. That's trying to take his crown. And in a spiritual sense, that's, you know, an abomination with Deuteronomy 22.5. You see that, you know, woman should not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. She should not wear the king's crown and try to rule. She should not judge other people. Remember, our husband wears the breastplate of judgment. You stop and you think about it. We're not holy by what we wear. It's obedience. It's not self-righteousness. When it's obedience, you stop and you really think about it. That versus self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is like thinking you're holy of your own self. Will our Lord, our husband, he wears the mitre of holiness unto the Lord. So he is who, the one who makes us holy. We're redeemed by his blood, washed from our sins by his blood. He's the one who redeemed us. He saved us. He cleansed us. And it's called the washing of the water by the word of God, that crystal clear stream that's written of in, in uh, Revelation. I believe it's chapter 22. That stream of water clear as crystal. You know, that is the washing of the water. You know? So when we look at these things, we don't want to be like that. We don't want to be like Jezebel or Athaliah. Even Vashti. Esther would have never become queen if Vashti hadn't rebelled. And what happened? She lost her place. You know, sisters, it's time that, you know, women do try to be ladies. You know, seek ye the old paths. Where's the good way? As Jeremiah said. You know, the good way is the way of God says, you know, because Jesus said, you know, a man came to Jesus and said, good master, what must I do to have eternal life? And, and he said, why well, call us out me good? There's none good but one, and that is God. And, and when you really stop and think about it, it says, he that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. You go to Psalm 143, 10, and it says, thy spirit is good. Lead me to the land of uprightness. So Jesus is one spirit with God. So they are one. Okay? Even though he's his son, they are one in spirit. So yes, even as Islam teaches, you know, there's only one God. One God Almighty. Okay? And his son, Jesus Christ, is not made such as what we make with carnal sex, you know, and that in the natural, you know, but he spoke him into existence. We see it in Genesis. Let there be light, and there was light. And that, as it's written, in him was life, and the life was the light of man. God is light, and in him no darkness. You know? And when we look at these things, we can see when he said, let there be light, and there was light. That was, you know, before this world was made. He, you know, Jesus, it's written, he's the beginning of the creation of God. And when we look at these things and we see them in a spiritual sense, I, isn't it just wonderful to know, you know, that here he is, he was formed before the foundation of the world so that we could be the bride of Christ, okay? And when we look at that, then we can also see that the sun, moon, and stars were created on the fourth day. And we stop and we look at that, it's like this greater light to rule the day, the lesser light.
to separate light from darkness. And the stars, they were all created on the fourth day, not the first. So when we look at this now, look at this, okay? The greater light to rule the day. Jesus said, my Father is greater than all. Deuteronomy 32.3 says, ascribe ye greatness unto God. Okay? God is light, and in him no darkness, a greater light. Okay, to rule the day. Paul said, we're children of the day. Not of the night, we're children of the day. And we look at this, oh, and then, and then there's that lesser light, and we see Christ made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, yet crowned with all glory and honor. Bless be his holy name. Praise God. And he's that lesser light that separates the light from darkness. You know, the Bible says, praise God, it says, God who is holy, sanctified in righteousness, and Jesus is made unto us according to 1 Corinthians 1.30, wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. You know, he fulfilled that law of God for us. You know, he's our righteousness. So God, who is holy, God, who is light, is sanctified, set apart, made holy. He is actually separated from sinful man through Christ, the mediator. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So we can see that, you know, Jesus is that the sun, that's that type and shadow of God. When we look up in the sky and we see the sun, we can be thankful that there's a God who loved us enough to send his son. And well, at night when we see that moon up there, you know, we don't worship the planets, but yet we can be thankful. We can look at it and say, you know, our Lord was created a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death so that he could die for our sins. He could come down as the bride he would redeem. Oh, you know, and he separates light from darkness. There's, you know, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He's out of the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. You know, you stop and you look at that. And then there's the stars also. And that the stars signify, you know, the children of Abraham. He said, Let's see it shall be as the stars of heaven for multitude. You know? So when you really get down to this, you know, and then we look at Islam versus Christianity and such, you know, yes, there's one God. The difference being that they count Jesus as a prophet and we count him as the Son of God. And that, but what they just don't see is he was spoken into existence. And when you get down to it, you know, uh, there are Islamic people out there that they do believe Jesus is the Son of God, but yet they identify as Islamic. And when you really just stop and think about it, you know, on that, <clears throat> it's... Uh, Mother's teeth. 
teach your daughters to be wise and mothers. And when you go back to the, you know, the long dresses for modesty and the veil, it doesn't have to be in the cap, but you go back to wearing the veils and such, people will know, they'll ask you. Then you can give an answer. And you can say, yes, my Lord came into this world. He died for my sins. And he gave everything for me, so I have to deny myself and give everything for him. I love him enough to do it. I cherish him enough to do it. I fear him enough to do it. And I'm thankful enough to do it. You can give the answer. You don't have to just right away. And that same holds true with Islamic sisters. You know, if you love the Lord, if he opens your eyes, you know, and then always remember, Naaman the leper, when he was cleansed, he was allowed to worship in the house of Remnant. Okay? On that. And you, it, you know, if an Islamic sister, if she comes, you know, if the Lord opens her eyes, you know, and she sees Jesus as the Son of God, there's still one God that's Jesus' Father, Jehovah Lord God Almighty. Just be ready to give an answer. You don't have to go running around right away saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, repent, repent. Sometimes that can do more harm than good because it, get, it can be turned into arrogance. But, you know, you're dwelling, you know, with your Islamic brethren and such, you know, and then you go to the mosque. While they're worshiping, you worship. You know, and when you look at it in that light, you're ready to give an answer. You're not trying to beat people over the head with a Bible and, and such like that. And sooner or later, somebody probably say, well, you know, you, you change a little bit. You're a little bit different. And that's when you, it opens the door that you can give an answer and say, yes, I, Lord, open my eyes. Now, I'm not going to, you know, just try to slam Islamic people. I don't want to do that, heaven forbid. There's a lot of Islamic sisters out there. And then I have to hold them in high esteem for the position they hold, their willingness. You know, some of them uh, who have been reverts from Christianity and such, you know, they've gone back to where now, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, have gone from the hijab to the niqab for modesty's sake. So, you know, and then you can't, we can't lump everybody together. As this video started out, the difference between transgenders and Enochs, there's a God-given meekness for an Enoch. There's a God-given boldness when they're like that, you know, the uh, Ibn Malik or the Enoch on the chariot. There is a God-given boldness that will go beyond your wildest dreams. And that same one who can just be a sister to you could be your nightmare if you see us the other way. He could really be a man of war. Praise God. But you know, right now my concern is this. I want my sisters out there to be saved. We've got a lot going on in the world. We've got coronavirus. Right now, Islamic, you know, the dresses of as and niqab is actually, you know, probably one of the best non-medical forms of protection when you get down to it. And, and uh, I just want the sisters to be saved. I don't want them to try and be men and damn themselves. And I'm willing, you know, if the Lord wants me to be in you, I can teach them who he is from the law and the prophets and the Psalms and the Proverbs. If he really wants me to teach them and he opens their eyes and their heart and they want to be taught then I feel, you know, they can feel free to ask me. Well, I, I would prefer to live stream it, you know, and, and speak, but I'm also willing, if anybody wants to ask questions, to either answer them on the comments or even do a, live, do a video like this to answer their questions, you know. But yeah, so, you know, I just want my sisters to be saved. It's a shame what's been preached these last 60, 70, how, however long, how they've taken it from being the bride of Christ to where everybody's so full of pride and ego and everybody wants to be a soldier for Christ. There were no female soldiers in the Old Testament. None whatsoever.
whatsoever. You got to twist scripture to make that. But if we use only the Word of God and the Spirit of God to reveal the truth, then we can please Jesus. And that's really what matters. And I want my sisters to be saved. You know, to to be as an Enoch and to share with sisters as a sister. That means more than a bunch of macho male pride to try and be, you know, God's man of the hour or some soldier for Christ. You know, and your soul is too precious. Christian sisters, your soul is too precious. Islamic sisters, your soul is too precious. Anybody 